أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله الصلاة والسلام على رسول الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. So the next uh, internal control feature that almost all companies use is having a bank account and preparing a bank reconciliation. So every time you deposit money into the bank and you record it in your company books, the bank also records the deposit. And anytime you take money out of the bank and you record it in your company books, in your accounts, the bank also records it. So you have two sets of records, one maintained by the bank and one maintained by the company. However, the, the problem is that the timing of these uh, transactions are sometimes they don't fall in the same accounting period. So for example, let's say you, you write somebody a check and you give it to them on the 30th of November and they don't go to the bank on that same day, right? To, to cash your check. So you wrote the check and you subtracted the amount from your company books, but the person takes it to the bank, let's say after office hours or the following day, the bank is going to record that check being subtracted, that amount being subtracted from your bank account in the following month. So when you get the bank statement at the end of the month, it will not, not match. So to match the bank transactions with the book transactions, every company prepares something called a bank reconciliation every month, right? The company prepares something called a bank reconciliation, and we're going to uh, discuss what that is and how it is done. The bank uh, statement, when the bank statement comes, it has certain uh, additions and subtractions from the account that the company may not have recorded. For example, the bank may take a service charge, which the company did not record in its books until it got the bank statement so the service charge let's say the company bank charges a 15 dollar or 100 real service charge for the bank's bank account this is not going to be recorded until the bank statement is received so this amount has not been subtracted from the company books also if there is an nsf check right an nsf check so let's say one of your customers paid with a check and you deposited that check into your company bank account and your customer does not have enough money in the bank to honor that check then if that happens then the comp the check will bounce right so the customer let's say gave you a thousand reals and you added that to your cash in the accounting records and you deposited that into the bank well, you're thinking the thousand dollars or thousand reals will be added to your bank account, but the customer does not have that money in the bank. So there will be an NSF note in your bank statement saying that this check was not honored. So what you have to do is you have to reverse that transaction, right? So when you receive that check, you debited cash and you credited accounts receivable. But this is no longer, this has not been paid. So you have to reverse that. You have to, again, debit accounts receivable and credit cash because the amount is not paid. You follow. If there is any collection on the bank statement that happens automatically, for example, there may be a loan payment that gets deposited into the bank automatically. It is possible that the company has not recorded that, and you can record that when you get the bank statement. So there are certain things that are affecting the bank statement that are not affecting the accounting records. So you have to adjust the accounting records for those amounts. At the same time, there are certain things that are happening to the accounting records that are not showing in the bank statement and you have to adjust for those. For example, you may have something uh, 
called deposits in transit. Deposits in transit are those deposits that were made in the bank, but the bank did not record it until the following period. How could this happen? Let's say the bank closes at two o'clock on Thursday and whatever sales you had after two o'clock, you took that deposit to the bank. You can deposit the money electronically, right? And it gets added uh, to your bank, but it's not added to your bank statement until the bank opens on Monday. So any deposit you made Thursday night, Friday, Saturday, your company records that in the books on that same day, but the bank does not record it until it opens on Sunday. So if the month ended on Saturday, those three days deposits would be in transit. So your accounting records, records have added those deposits, but the bank did not, you follow. Similarly, you can have something called outstanding checks. You may have written checks to people who have not taken those checks to your bank. That means you have subtracted the money from your, the first case, you added the money and the bank did not. In the second case, you subtracted the check as soon as you wrote it from your checkbook, but they did not go to the bank until two, three, five, seven days later. In that case, those would be outstanding checks. That means you subtracted something from your bank account in your accounting records, but the bank did not. You follow? And then we discussed the bank memoranda, what we had in the previous slide, things that the bank has done that you have not done, either positives or negatives, bank charge or deposit that is going electronically, automatically. And then on top of that, there could be errors. There could be errors made by your accounting crew, or there could be errors made by the bank, right? Although this is not very common, you will not have an error every month, right? But it can happen, right? In those cases, you have to adjust. So let's take a look at the format of how this is done, and then let's take a look at an example with numbers. This is the format where you start off with two balances. You have a balance in the bank statement and you have a balance per books. So you have a balance that is showing on, let's say November 30th in the bank statement, and you have a balance that is showing in your accounting records on November 30th these two numbers are almost never the same. They're different because of the time differences of the recording. So you have to adjust both of these numbers. Anything that you added, but the bank did not add, but it happened in that period, you would act, add it to the bank's balance. Anything that you subtracted, but the bank did not subtract, that happened in that period, you would subtract it from the bank statement balance. On the other hand, anything that the bank added during that period that you did not add, and it is correct, you would add to your books. Anything that the bank subtracted that you did not subtract from your books, you would have to subtract it. If you do this, if you do these, then the ending balance for both the bank and the books will be the same. I'm going to give you an example. I'm going to show you an example and then I have an exercise for you as well that you will do. It's not uh, difficult to do here in theory, although I see some faces, you know, that uh, display confusion. In life, you know, I learned how to prepare the actual income statement that you see, right, from the, the actual balance, the cash statement of cash flow, it, within less than a month using the system, right? I could prepare the income statement balance sheet, but it took me a few months 
until I could do a bank reconciliation exactly correctly. You follow? Because there are so many transactions in a given month recorded by the bank and by the accountant, the books, right? That matching them and finding the exact error where the problem, where the difference is, right? It's not uh, very easy. It, there are, you, know, you have to, I mean, after you do it a hundred times, you become an expert, but the process is not easy. This is the whole, the concept is not easy. You're doing it many, many times, you get used to it. Because if you make two errors, right? If you make an error of 5,000 on one side, and you make an error on the other side of 4,950. These two errors, one on one side, one in the positive side, one in the negative, negative side, will cancel each other out, showing you a $50 difference. When you have a $50 difference that you cannot find, you would think, oh, shit, $50, you know, I'm dealing with millions, what's so $50? But hiding in that $50 are two errors, one, 5,000, error in this side, positive side, let's say, and one for $4,950 on the negative side. So you have to check both sides to see whether both sides, the, the, the add additions and the subtractions, are both independently accurate. And again, this is, you don't have to do here. This is, I'm talking, talking about a real bank reconciliation in a real life situation where hundreds of transactions. Here you have four or five transactions, and once I explain to you with numbers, this is a piece of cake, inshallah. So let's take a look. You see here, we have balance per books and balance per bank. <clears throat> uh, balance per bank, it says, you get the bank statement, and the bank statement says the balance is $15,907.45, and the books, which is your accounting record, show 11,000. So there's a difference. These two numbers are different. There are certain things that you added and subtracted that the bank did not, and there are certain things the bank added and subtracted that your books did not. And we need to know what those amount, what those items are, and based on those items, we need to identify what you need to add and what you need to subtract, right? So the first thing it says, deposit in transit, right? Deposit in transit. So now, what is deposit in transit? There is money that you deposited into the bank. Did you record it in your books when you deposited it into the bank? Mm -hmm. Yes. That means this is added to your number. This number is added to your number. When you take the money to the bank, before you take the money to the bank, you debit cash and you credit something. Now you have the cash. You go to the bank and you deposit it into the bank. Transit means the bank is still, you know, bank is yet to add that. It has not added. That means you have to add this number to which balance? It's $2,201. Where do you have to add that? The bank balance. Because the bank has not added that number. You follow? It's included in your number, in the 11,000 number, but it's not included in the 15,000. Are you following? Right? So, here you will add. You see that? See it here? Can you see it from far? It's small. This is the bank balance. You have to add that, right? You follow? When you go to this slide, you have it printed out as well, some of you. The next thing is outstanding checks. Outstanding checks are those checks that you have written, but the people you gave them to have not deposited them into their bank account. That means when you write a check, have you subtracted it from your balance? As a company, when I write a check to you, do I reduce my balance when I give this check to you? Of course. Immediately, as soon as I write the check, I debit expense and I credit them. So, if I give it to you, I don't care when you take the money. As soon as I write the check, 
I debit the expense and I credit cash. So I have subtracted it from my account. But it has not cleared the bank. That means the bank has not subtracted it yet. You follow? You following? So you have to reduce that number from the bank standards. Okay? Are you following? No. You don't have to add. This money will go. Right? You have done the right thing by subtracting it. It will be subtracted from the bank. But they haven't done it here yet. So you subtract it from the bank standards. Okay? You subtract it from the bank. You don't go to the bank and they can do it. You are doing something called the bank reconciliation where you want to find out why is 15,000 and why mine is 11,000. Right? You want to reconcile the difference so that you can come to a number that is the same for both records. Are you following? The bank is the bank. So you did not pay the bank. The bank account belongs to you. So you have the same. You have two records for the same account, right? So think about it this way. You have a bank account. You have a bank account. Yeah. You give me a check for a thousand dollars. You reduce it. You have ten thousand dollars to reduce it. But I hope that you hold the check in my pocket for a month. You get the bank statement and it shows 10,000. Is that true? Are you going to the bank some day soon? How much money do you really have? Do you have 10,000 or 20,000? Although the bank shows you 10,000, how much do you have really? None. So you should report, reduce it from the bank's amount, right? Because the bank is yet to reduce it. Are you following? Right? Have some sense that it comes to you. <laughs> because it's intensive. I'll send you check. So the company they have to control the scope. No, no, no. The company is account and account and And that shows eleven thousand. The bank has fifteen thousand. The bank reconciliation is prepared so that you know why there is a difference. Right? So you will subtract everything that should have been subtracted from the bank amount. Add everything that should have been added to the bank account. Add everything that should have been added to your book and subtract everything that should have been subtracted from your book so that you can come to the same amount. Okay? So the third thing is error. What happened? This check 443 was recorded as 1262, but the correct amount is 1226. So what happened? The check, when it was written, it was written for 1,256, 1,256. The check was written for that. And the check was given to someone. The amount on the check was 1,226. So the person, when they go to the bank, how much money can they take from you? 1,226. But in the accounting records, when the debit and the credit was recorded, it was recorded for 1,262. Okay? All right? So you have two things going on here. Check here. This is the check, and the amount in the check is 1,236. This is the amount in the check, right? Whatever else is written, the signature. So this is the amount. This is the actual check, right? This is the check. And then you record an, an entry. This is cash. 
pens. We recorded 1,262 and we recorded 1,262. We follow. This is recorded in your accounting records. That is separate. But the check is 1,226. How much money will the bank subtract when they get this check? Hmm? 1,226. How much money did you subtract? 1,262. That means we have an error of 36 dollars. We call it an error of 36 dollars. So you subtracted 36 dollars extra. You have to add it back, right? So what you have to do is you have to do 36 here and 36 here. You follow? Right? You have to add 36 back to your cash. So you have this cash balance, you have to add 36 because you subtracted 36 too much from your account. Is that clear? Right? Alright, so that's the third. Now these are all is on your side. Then we have the bank. It has first problem it has is an NSF check of four thousand four hundred and twenty-five dollars and sixty cents. So what happened when you uh, deposited this check four hundred and twenty-five dollars and sixty cents? When you sold, when you sold you had credit to sales four hundred and fifty six dollars I'm sorry, twenty-five dollars and sixty cents, and you have an account receivable of four hundred and twenty five dollars and sixty cents. This is what happened when you sold. When you got the check yeah, 425.6 and 425.6. So what happened? You added this money to your cash when you received the check. Okay? Are you following? So far? This is the first transaction, right? And this is the second transaction when you deposited the check. So the customer paid you the check. You deposited the check into your cash account and you debited cash and you credited accounts receivable. Are you following? But the customer does not have money in the bank. So the bank did not, your bank did not get the money from the customer's bank. That means the bank did not add 425 to your account. So now you have to stop because that money is no longer there. Are you following? That money is no longer there. So you have to reverse this entry. So you have to subtract the four hundred and fifty-five dollars and sixty cents because you did not get that money from your record. Does that make sense? Are you following? The second thing here is very simple. The bank charged you a thirty dollar fee for printing checks that you did not subtract from your amount in the books, so you subtract that. And the bank collected notes. The bank received directly deposited in your account $1,035, notes receivable from one of your borrowers. This you did not add to your books, so you would add that to your books. $1,035 coming in to your account. So once you do this, once you do these additions and subtractions, both the sides should show the same amount. 12,204.85, both sides should show the same amount if you do the additions and subtractions. Are you following? 
right? 7.45 p.m. is a little bit late for this type of stuff, but what can you do? <laughs> okay. Uh, I promise you this is not difficult. You review this one more time and you do the exercise that I have posted. It will become easy, inshallah. So comes with this, along with this, you have to... So here, what it says, if you read this, uh, it says collection of notes receivable 1050 less $15 bank collection fee. So your customer actually gave you 1050 but the bank withdrew $50, $15 collection fee. Monsters. Charge you fees for everything. Anyhow. <laughs> now, to record that, you have to debit cash for 1035 and then credit notes receivable for 1050 because that's what the customer paid you but the bank took 15 right the bank took 15. so when you transfer money the bank sending the transfer takes money the other side the bank getting the money also takes money i don't understand anyhow it's the net your net addition to cash is 1035 it's in the description if you go to the description it's it's described that 1050 less 15 dollars in the previous slide right so the cash is 1035 what is added to your bank 1035 and that's all you're adding when you're doing the bank reconciliation but when you're doing the accounting records you have to record the notes receivable because you have a notes receivable 1050 right that is credited and cash is 1035 and then you have an expense of $15 for the collection that the bank did for you right and then when you all of these transactions have a, an entry that I showed you here in the T accounts but you have to record that so the cash right is 36 uh, you have to add $36 to cash and here they showed accounts payable. So, you know, it's either accounts payable or expense, whichever it is, you have to credit. Usually it's an accounts payable because uh, all expenses are first recorded as accounts payable. The other is accounts receivable. So here you have to, again, uh, debit accounts receivable for 425 and credit cash for 425 right because you did not get the money so you have to reduce the cash so all of these put together in your cash account you know you started off with 11589 you added 1035 and you added 36 and you subtracted 425 and you subtracted 30. 30 is the miscellaneous expense for printing the check and cash credited. So uh, with all of these debits and credits, your cash balance would be then 12,204.85. So the bank reconciliation results in a number that is neither equal to the bank nor equal to your original book amount. It is another number. Otherwise, your bank statement balance would never balance, match your books because there is always deposits in transit and there are always checks outstanding right and there are always charges that the bank charges you don't record etc etc some of these charges are not fully known until the end of the uh, month well you could go online and you can see but it doesn't if, if recording those small items in the middle of the month is inefficient so it is done at the end these small 15 30 and so forth they are added and subtracted at the end doing this bank reconciliation okay yeah it will never match there, there is always a lag there is always a lag if the bank will never record exactly the way you record at the time that you record so you have to do the bank reconciliation this is one of the things that uh, is very hectic for the accountant to do at the end of the month 
Okay. Uh, electronic fund transfer, obviously, uh, there's nothing to teach you about that. You know the money can be transferred electronically between accounts and so forth. And the electronic fund transfer or making payments electronically is definitely better than handling physical cash uh, because the internal control is much stronger in that case. Okay, so this uh, brings us to the end of the business with the bank. Just have a little bit left. Uh, maybe we can finish in 15, 20 minutes. There is something called a cash equivalent. Cash equivalent uh, are those things that are not cash, but they can be converted to cash without losing value. So you may have investments that are maturing very soon and you know their value and their value will not vary, right? Their market value, they're close to maturity. So they're very close to cash, cash equivalents, right? Or something that you can readily convert into cash. So let's say you have uh, uh, gold bars and so forth, right? And there is a ready market for it. You can easily sell. You can go, the, go to the exchange and easily sell. Whatever the gold price is today, you can go and you can get that without losing value, right? You know, uh, there are different types of, of gold. If you have jewelry, for example, you will lose value because when you purchased it, it included making charge and so forth. When you sell it, they will buy the weight, right? So, but the gold bars, right? you can sell so it's just an example there could be other things that are cash equivalent right that you can sell without losing value so this is reported in the financial statements with cash cash and cash equivalents are reported in the same line if you have cash equivalents there is something else called restricted cash which is if you have a particular amount of cash that you have already committed to a project or promised to give a particular cause, that means you can't use that cash for anything else. This restricted cash is reported separately so that the financial statement reader would know that this cash is not available for use otherwise, okay? So these two elements, if you put it on the balance sheet, they look like this. You have the cash and cash equivalents in one line, and you have something called the restricted cash, which is not available for use in any other purpose, for any other purpose, okay? Is that clear? Simple concept. Uh, we have seen this uh, operating cycle slide once before, if you remember. Uh, for a merchandising company, the cash is received, which is used for buying inventory, and the inventory becomes available for sale, which creates accounts receivable, which goes to cash, which becomes cash once it's collected. So this is the natural cycle. There's nothing new for you here, right? You get cash, you buy inventory, you sell inventory, you create accounts receivable, then you collect on that accounts receivable and it continues. This is the cycle of the cash coming in and going out. There are certain uh, basic principles of handling the cash uh, and most companies, you know, most likely stick to them with some exceptions based on the company policy. First is you want to collect the receivable as soon as possible. So you want to increase the speed. You want the accounts receivable turnover to be quick. You want the cash to come in. You don't want to tie up a lot of cash in inventory. You want inventory to be low. You want to turn the inventory around. So you want people to buy your inventory as soon as you produce them or as soon as you buy them, right? So inventory turnaround, you want to do very quickly. You want to monitor the due dates and you want to make sure that they're paid on time and you're not late. 
If you are late, then it will harm the credit history. You want to make sure that you want a good relationship with all of the vendors and suppliers. You want to monitor the payments. There are certain seasons uh, that are better than other seasons for different types of companies. And you want to plan major expenses during the time when you have cash inflow, high cash inflow. So for example, if you are, uh, your business is to sell vac vacation packages, there are certain times of the year when people go on vacation more than other times. And it depends on which part of the world you are, right? Uh, here, you know, summer is not the best time to go around and do things. Winter is, in some countries, winter is so harsh, people do, uh, you know, outdoor things during summer. For example, example Canada. So you want, if your business is, uh, most businesses are, and the business is never, you know, steady. Most businesses have high and low seasons. If you have high expenditures, you want to upgrade your equipment, things like that. You want to plan that at a time when you have high cash inflow, when you have more business. And then uh, if you have cash sitting and you cannot, uh, you don't need to use it and you have enough safety net and so forth, then you can invest the cash in something that would uh, generate return. So these are some basic principles that most companies follow in relation to cash. Okay, the next concept briefly, what we have here is having a cash budget. Every company has uh, cash budgets that include cash receipts and cash disbursements. So the cash that they expect to come in and the cash that they expect to pay during a period of time. And they want to see, do they have enough money coming in to pay for things that they have to pay for during that period. So let's say, look at this first quarter, you have, the, it starts with the beginning cash amount. So this is a budget, this is not actual. And then they plan that they will get $168,000 from their customers and they will sell some securities. So they will have this much money coming in and then they have all of these expenses, salaries and inventory purchase and other expenses that add up to 182. So they have 208 coming in and 182 going out and they start off with 38. That means at the end, they will have 25,500 extra. Each business has a bottom line, a, a bottom amount that it wants to keep in the bank. So this company, by looking at this budget, we can tell that this company wants to keep at least $15,000 in its bank at the end of every period because when they don't they borrow you see this at the end of the second quarter the budget says they will have only 12,000 excess whatever will come in and whatever will go out it will result in ending balance of 12,000 so they will borrow 3,000 to make the ending balance 15,000 they want to have at least 15,000 dollars in the bank each company has a policy, cash policy, that says at least this much money should be in the bank. If you don't have it, you should borrow and make it that amount. You follow, right? So the budget lets you see that amount in the future. This is the budget. It is possible at the end of the second quarter, they do have 15000 and they don't need to, right? Most small businesses, when they open a bank account, they have an arrangement with the bank that the bank will give them a short-term loan automatically, right, up to an amount if they need it, and which will be paid very quickly within a month or two or three months like that. So this is called, in the bank's terminology, what is it called? What do you call it, Mr. Sosa, in your bank? 
Bank different banks can have different terminology. In the US, it's called credit line. This is a credit line, right? You have it, right? You have it, right? you have it readily available. If you need, you can borrow that money from the bank, right? Immediately. And you don't have to apply, you don't have to. This is a pre-arranged loan. You can take it if you need it, and then you have to, there are certain conditions when you have to pay it back, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. It's already decided. So immediately when you need it, you don't have to go and look for this shortage, you can immediately get it quickly. So this is the arrangement with the bank. So the budget allows you to look into the future to see how much money would be coming in, how much money would be going out, and would you have enough at the end? If you don't have enough, how much do you need, right? So this is uh, an overall idea of the cash. All right, the last concept we have is the petty cash, which was one of the two controls of disbursement that we discussed. One was the voucher, the other one was petty cash. Petty cash is uh, a small amount of cash that is kept on location to pay for small purchases, small things that you need to buy. So the first thing that you have to do is establish how much money you need to keep. So uh, you decide that you need you, you are going to keep a hundred dollars, okay, to pay for small things. Right? Maybe you need some supplies or it can be, you know, it depends on what your needs are, what your business size of your business is, etc., etc. So you decide how much it is. And if you need to buy something small quickly, you pay from that fund. And as soon as that fund goes down, there are points in time when you replenish that fund. So let's say you know you keep that money and then you spend from that money fifty dollars at the end of the month you'll have to put fifty dollars back into that fund making that 100 so the petty cash fund should be replenished it should be made 100 at the end of every month let's say for an example so the journal entry the first journal entry to record is to debit petty cash and credit cash so you take out the cash from your bank and you establish the petty cash, the debit petty cash. So you have $100 in a petty cash. Okay, you have petty cash. You have $100. Okay, so this money is there. Then, throughout the month, you had these small items that you paid. So you paid for postage, right, stamps, $45, $44 some supplies, miscellaneous supplies, maybe pens or paper or something that you purchased, and then miscellaneous expense, maybe you tipped someone, you gave a tip to someone or whatever it is that you paid for, some small $5 expense. So what happens, this uh, amount is recorded once the receipts are given at the end to these individual accounts and uh, this actually should should say the credit should go to petty cash, not cash. This should go to petty cash. If you know, once you uh, pay this, how much money should you have in petty cash? You pay for these expenses. How much money should be available in petty cash? But let's say you don't have 13. Let's say you have 12. If you do have 12, then what you have to do is you have to record $1 in over and short, right? In this case, it's short, making this 88. You have to make this 88 and make this 12. If you don't have the $13, you only have 12. So $1 that is not accounted for, it goes. It goes to cash short, right? And then right, you have at the end of the month or at the beginning of the next month to make the petty cash 100, how much money do you need to put in here? Hmm? 
ATA, right? So you would then reduce the cash, add ATA here, and make this 100. Do you follow? Right? So don't worry about this balance here, right? Put this ATA back. Are you following? So this is, I'm showing you this so that you understand the idea between the cash and petty cash, right? This entry between cash and petty cash, right? The credit and petty cash and debit and petty cash, instead of doing this, they directly go to cash. Are you following? Instead of doing the debit and credit to petty cash because it's going to be for the same amount. The petty cash will be replenished for exact same amount that it's spent. So you would have a debit and the credit in petty cash for the same amount. Instead of doing that, it goes to cash directly. Does it make sense? Right. So this is how it's done. This is how it's showing in the textbook and so forth. You can do this as well in real life. Follow. So that you follow why it's going to cash. You follow. Why it's going to cash? Because you would end up debiting and crediting the petty cash for the same amount. Whatever you spend from the petty cash will be put back in the petty cash. So this is the actual working of this entry. Are you following? Where is the $12 coming from? The $12 is the difference between what was there at the beginning and what was there at the end. 12. So you have to put back 8, 88 yeah, to make it 100. Does that make sense? All right. So this is the end of this chapter. It's the same concept. Both, both entries are exactly the same concept. In one, one dollar is missing, the other one is not. One dollar is not missing. In both cases, they have recorded it to cash. In both cases, you can record it to petty cash and then remove it from petty cash, right? In both cases, the first one was 88, the second one was 88. You could go through, in both of these cases, you can go through the, the, both the entries or you could just go to cash directly instead of touching petty cash because whatever you debit petty cash with, you will have to credit petty cash with it as well. Hmm? <laughs> this is an expense, cash short over, it, this is short, this is an expense account called cash over and short, right? There is an expense account called cash over and short. Look at, the have the financial statements from the company that uh, uh, you're working on? Anybody has it? Yeah? See, you can find the cash over and short. It should be in the operating expenses. In the income statement, go to the income statement, go to the operating expenses, right? Other operating expenses, you should be able to find that account. It goes in operating expenses. Operating expenses. Did you find it? Yes. Yeah. 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 Okay. All right. 
So the two events we have left are the contest, which is on November 24th, that you discuss. I'm going to stop recording here, inshallah.